Welcome to this oral history of Herma Hill Kay. My name is Mira Theo, and I'm interviewing Professor Kay for the AALS section on Women in Legal Education Oral History Project. We're at the Washington, D.C. Marriott Wardman Park, and today is January 4th, 2015. So thank you again. A pleasure. And um, we're going to skip through some of the early years, since that's been thoroughly documented already, and jump straight to college. So. Can you tell me a little bit about your college years? Um, how did you pick that school? Did you know you'd be going to college? And broadly, what was your experience like? Oh, well, I knew I was going to college. And my father was a Methodist minister, and he wanted me to uh, go to a Methodist school. And the choices uh, for me to apply to were Duke, which was very close to home and a very good school, and SMU, which was probably not as highly rated, but had the advantage of being farther away from home. <laughs> so I went to SMU, and when I got there, we lived in a place called um, uh, Union, South Carolina, and they had sent a, um, all the application materials, for some reason, to Paris, France. And so I didn't get the uh, materials that I have showed up, and um, they finally got me settled in, and Rush Week was in full swing. And I hadn't really thought at all about pledging a sorority or what sororities were. But it was the most amazing experience. Because here these young women were, and their mothers had been in sororities. And if they weren't pledged by their mother's sorority, the mother plucked them out of SMU and took them immediately to another school where they could start all over again. And I thought, wow, this must be really important. So eventually I, I did the pledge Sigma Kappa, um, and uh, it was a very nice experience. But that, that really sort of made me wonder whether SMU was really an intellectual place or a social place. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you said that uh, SMU had the advantage of being further away, can you explain a little bit more about that? Well, you know, I, I was an only child, and uh, my mother was a school teacher, my father was a Methodist minister, and they kept a very close eye on me, mm -hmm. and I thought I'd like a little bit more independence. What did you major in in college, and how did you make that decision? Oh, well, my my mother had the idea that I should major in elementary education, mm -hmm. so because she was a third grade teacher. And I started out doing that, but right after my first course in, in the, you know, elementary education, I was signed up for a course in political philosophy. And the difference between the depth and searching qualities of the two courses were more than I could bear. And so finally, without telling mother, I dropped the elementary education <laughs> course and switched to a majoring, a, a double major in English and philosophy. And then was it during college or sometime later that you thought more clearly about law school? Oh, I always wanted to be a lawyer. I mean, there is that uh, sort of apocryphal story that everybody's heard a zillion times, but it does happen to be true. When, when I was in the sixth grade in South Carolina, uh, we had a civics class, and the teacher wanted to have a debate, and she chose for the subject, resolved the South should have won the Civil War. And I was the only one who was willing to volunteer to take the negative. And uh, I did have history on my side. And once we finished, the teacher said, if you were my daughter, I'd send you to law school. So I went rushing home, mommy, mommy, I'm going to law school. And she said, oh, no, you won't. She said, you can't make any living as a woman lawyer. You're going to teach elementary education just like I did. So that was what got me started on this course. But as it turned out, I was able to support myself as a lawyer. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about law school, um, when you decided to formally apply, and um, how you picked the school? <laughs> I didn't pick the school. The admissions officer at SMU Law School picked it for me. It was a, um, you know, I mean, I, I still can't believe how lucky I was to be in the right place at the right time, but. Once I became a dean, I understood what his problem was. Uh, Chicago, at that point, 
had distributed scholarships, full scholarships for all three years around the country because they wanted to turn themselves from a regional school into a national school. And SMU had one of these scholarships and they picked the recipient and sent him off to Chicago and he or she was admitted. Well, on the day that I had gone over to see the SMU admissions officer, I had an appointment with him right after lunch, I learned later that the uh, Chicago admissions officer, Joe Desha Lucas, had called on him and had said to him, uh, the people you're sending us are not doing very well in law school. Send us somebody with a stronger record. So at lunch, he was given a problem. I walk in the door after lunch. I'm the solution to his problem. He looks at my transcript and he says, well, I said, would you admit me to SMU? And he said, well, of course we will, but wouldn't you rather go to Chicago? I can get you a full scholarship for three years. And I said, where's Chicago? <laughs> I'd never been out of the South. Either. So that's how I got to Chicago. And it was, as I say, one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me. What was law school like for you? It was fantastic, utterly fantastic. I fell in love absolutely from the very first uh, with contracts. Mm -hmm. Malcolm Sharp taught contracts and it was uh, just amazing. And the Chicago faculty at that time was I think one of the stronger faculties that it was ever before or since. And it was really quite an experience. Were there any other particular teachers who influenced you in law school? Well, Soya Menchikoff was there, and, and uh, she had uh, she was a wonderful role model. I never took any classes from her because she taught commercial law, and I was not very interested in commercial law. Um, and I had um, family law from Max Reinstein, who you know took a very Germanic and somewhat conservative approach to family law. So mainly what I learned from him was to how to think outside of his box. Mm -hmm. And I, I, he, he later um, uh, wrote a book about the, the law and the books and the law and practice uh, about family law and mentioned this no-fault divorce law that I was instrumental in getting drafted. So I think he accepted the fact that I was willing to go a little bit further to the left than he was. Mm -hmm. And he came around. Yeah. How many women were there in your entering class? There were, uh, I think, three of us. Uh, we, um, two of us had been accepted. And, and uh, then the third woman was married to a male law student who had also been accepted. And he was working in some of the steel mills in Chicago to earn some money during the summer before he entered. And he had an accident and he became blind. So they admitted her with him and they went through law school together. She read all the cases to him and took all the notes and helped him get through. And they graduated together and opened a practice together. Wow. Yeah. Did you get to know the other women? Oh yeah, Amy Scoopy. She, she and I were the, uh, the two women who were also on the Law Review. And uh, she, I remember we went to a party one night uh, and with the, she had her husband and I had my husband. And, we looked around the room and Amy said to me, Herma, she said, do you realize that we're the only two women in the room who are lighting our own cigarettes? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, okay. <laughs> Was that a metaphor for other things? Yes, yes, indeed. And, and she's, she's been practicing in Washington. She, she's retired now. She's living in France. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but she and I uh, battled through it. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned that you and Amy both had your husbands at this event. Can you tell me more about your family situation during law school? Well, I was married to uh, uh, my first husband, who was a man called Jean-Paul Schrader. He was an artist, and uh, he and I uh, got married just uh, before I went to law school. And we uh, went there. We, he moved to Chicago and started working on his paintings there while I was in law school. Um, we never had any children, and we got divorced uh, not long after uh, I graduated. How was the decision to move together to Chicago for your... Oh, well, I'd been, I'd been admitted, uh, and he had no reason to... You, know, you could paint anywhere. Right? Mm -hmm. What was your living situation like there? Where did you go with him? Oh, well, Chicago... <laughs> you may remember, was sort of in the grips of the daily machine. And, and, and we, uh, we lived on the, uh, uh, the south side across the midway from the law school. And I think the first day we got there, the, um, this clump, clump, clump of boots, we were on the third floor walk up, knock at the door. 
open the door and here these two guys that could only be described as goons and one of them looked at me and they said, you new here? I said, yes. He said, you vote Democratic? And I said, yes. Do you need anything? He said. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, I guess I was accepted. Uh -huh. <laughs> But Daly ran that place with a hand, an iron hand. I remember watching dry him drive those open back trucks around to pick up people when they voted, you know, and they would come around two or three times a day if they weren't getting sufficiently ahead in the polls. I mean, in Chicago, vote early and often was taken literally. <laughs> so um, when you're in law school, what did you think you might work doing after law school? Well, I thought I would you know, want to practice on Wall Street. And um, as I said in my talk yesterday, uh, I was um, a research assistant for Brainerd Curry, who was my most important mentor in conflict of laws. And after we'd finished working on two articles which we published together, uh, having to do with the constitutionality of his governmental interest analysis, I mentioned to him that um, I was thinking of going into teaching myself. And he said, Hmm. He said, there are not very many women law professors. And then he said, well, what you need is a Supreme Court clerkship. But that's hard to get unless, you know, somebody else, some other judge clerked for before. He said, I could probably get Roger Trainer to take you. Wow. So he called Roger Trainer, who offered me a clerkship sight unseen, and uh, I ultimately went out uh, and clerked for Trainer. It was one of the most wonderful years of my life, and I had wanted, you know, ultimately to teach. And Curry had thought that I needed the Supreme Court clerkship to get a position, and uh, Trainer tried to get me a position with Warren, but Warren was not at that point accepting women clerks, and so I went out to uh, uh, California. And it turned out that Barbara Armstrong, who was the first woman law professor in the country and was on the Berkeley faculty, was retiring. And the faculty decided that they needed to find a woman to replace her, uh, but they were casting a broad net. And one of the places that they always looked uh, for new faculty members was among trainers, law clerks. So the chair of the admissions committee called Trainer and said, Justice Trainer, do you have any good men clerking for you this year who are interested in going to teach you? And Trainer said, no, but I have a woman who's as good as any man I ever had. Would you like to interview her? Well, of course, they couldn't turn Trainer down, so they invited me over for an interview. And then um, I went over to interview, and that's what led to the story of the hat. I don't know if you want the story of the hat on tape or not. <laughs> All right, well, I, I was in, Chicago, in, in, in uh, San Francisco, and so uh, I wore you know, white gloves and suits and hats to a trainer's office to clerk for him. And naturally, when I went over to interview at Berkeley, uh, I you know, dressed in a similar fashion. And it was a warm spring day, and I chose my beautiful uh, sort of um, beige cloche that came down with a wide brim around my eyes. And I went around interviewing in people's offices. We didn't give job talks then. We just went around and talked to the faculty. And at the end of the day, I was having tea with Barbara at 3 o'clock. And we were in her office, and she kept getting these phone calls from her colleagues, and you know, four or five of them. And Barbara would pick up the phone, and finally she said, yes, I'll tell her. Stop calling. <laughs> so she looks at me across the table, and she says, you're going to have to take your hat off. The men want to see what you look like. <laughs> and I said, well, Professor Armstrong, I, you know, it's a warm day, my hair is long, and it'll be plastered to my head, and I really can't take my hat off. Barbara gave me this stare, and she said, well, all right, she says, but when you come to your second day of interviews, you can wear a smaller hat, can't you? And I said, oh, yes, of course, I have lots of hats. But I didn't know there was going to be a second day of interviews. Barbara said, there will be now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I put on my pillbox and came back and was interviewed again. Everybody saw what I looked like. I guess they were not repulsed. And they offered me the job. Why do you think they needed to see your face? I don't know. I mean, I really, maybe they thought I was shifty eyes or something. But, <laughs> but I, mean, I mean, the hat really did. You know, it, it came down quite low in the face. But. I guess it was a poor choice on my part, but 
luckily Barbara saved me. <laughs> Can you tell me about that first year of law teaching? Well, I was um, asked to teach Barbara's courses, of course, as she was retiring. And one of them was family law, which I had learned from Einstein and learned new ideas by rebelling against Einstein. So I liked to teach that. She also taught California community property, a subject of which I had utterly never heard at all because they didn't teach that in Chicago. Um, so Barbara undertook, she gave me her, she had bibliograph materials, she said none of the case books that were published were worth using, and so she gave me her bibliograph materials, and I went down to her office every day for tea before I went to class, and Barbara went over the assignment with me, and she literally taught me the class two minutes before I went in to teach it to my students. Mm -hmm. At a class of 75 people, of which only one was a woman, mm -hmm. and uh, she turned out to be a Kay Mickle Werdiger, who's now on the California Supreme Court. Uh, and Kay and I you know, still remember the, that class. And she said, you know, every time somebody asks you a question that we hadn't covered yet, you would say, we'll get to that in a few days, <laughs> which I did. I was hoping to heaven we would. <laughs> How did you and Professor Armstrong arrange, uh, arrive at that arrangement? Well, Barbara, you know, knew I couldn't do this on my own, and so she, uh, I mean, Barbara was a wonderful mentor. She was just fantastic. And I, I, first of all, I would never have gotten hired without her, and secondly, I would never have succeeded in teaching that course without her. But the third course I taught, the, after they offered me, a, the, after they told me I needed to teach those two courses, um, Dean Prosser, who had hired me, said, well, it's, what other course would you like to teach? Because people usually teach three courses at a seminar. And I said, well, I'd like to teach conflict of laws. And so he said, well, of course. Well, conflict of laws was being taught by the great Albert Ehrenschweig. And uh, Albert Ehrenschweig and Stefan Riesenfeld um, were both uh, from the old country. Albert was from Austria, Riesenfeld was from Germany. And they thought, you know, Everybody knows that well, one of them can't be right when the other one has to be wrong. And so they had, they had this kind of friendly rivalry. And um, uh, Albert didn't really care much for Curry's theory, even though he and Curry were good friends because the conflicts community was a fairly small place then as it is now. And so um, uh, he was um, uh, not terribly happy when I was given the other half of the conflicts course. But the students you know, were assigned, and as it turned out, um, I was seen as a very lucid English-speaking lecturer. Albert had a strong accent and was a little convoluted in the way he presented the material. And so a lot of Albert's students kind of sneaked out and went to my section. And when the dean found out about this, he called them in his office and he said, you can't do this. You signed up for <laughs> Professor Ernschweig's course. But uh, eventually uh, they stopped dividing the class in half and then I had, you know, some days I had 125 people in the class because conflicts was on the bar exam. Fortunately, they've taken it off the bar exam and, and I think next semester I'm going to have about 20 students. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Much better. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that uh, contracts was one of the classes that really captivated you in law yes. school. Did you think of teaching contracts as well? No, I, I, I didn't really. I mean, it, it wasn't so much the material as, as it was the way uh, the professor presented it. And he was really quite, uh, quite wonderful. What's the funniest thing that ever happened to you in your classroom? The funniest thing in my classroom? Well, actually, it didn't happen in Berkeley. It happened when I was visiting at Harvard. Uh, and I had been invited to come and, and teach a, a course in conflict of laws and one other course. And I said, how about sex discrimination, which they weren't offering at that, that moment. So they said, OK. But in my conflicts class, I had, uh, again, more men than women. And uh, I was talking to them about the uh, um, you know, federalism and, and the, the, the Erie case and all that, how it affected choice of law. And I started saying a few words about what the Erie case was all about. And this young man in the back row, without raising his hand or anything, said, you don't have to tell us about the Erie case. This is Harvard. And I looked at him and I said, 
thank you, I'll try to remember that I'm in the big time now. Well, that story was all over school in about three minutes. My enrollment jumped immediately, and he was given a dunce's cap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. uh, can you tell me more about your family situation during the early years when you were at Berkeley? Well, I, uh, I remarried, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I remarried uh, Larry Kay in, in 1963. And Larry uh, had been a student uh, at the, at the law school, and he and I, uh, you know, got along fairly well. But uh, that didn't last either, and so we were divorced in uh, 1966. And then I met my present husband, uh, who's recently passed away. Uh, but uh, we were married in 1975, and his name was Carol Brodsky. He was a psychiatrist. And he was the most wonderful man I had ever seen. And he had three boys, uh, and his um, middle son had three children, of whom my granddaughter, who's with me, Jessica Brodsky, is the, his oldest daughter and the only girl among the four grandchildren. Uh, and uh, so it was uh, just a wonderful, wonderful relationship. You spent some time talking about the mentorship that Barbara Armstrong provided to you, and a lot of the things you said about her are things that many others have said about you. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that, about your relationship with her, and how you think that may have influenced the mentor that you've become for so many years. Well, we, we were gradually increasing the numbers of women, as, as both schools were at that time. And there was another woman on the faculty who taught tax. Her name was uh, Bobby Barton. She was a graduate of uh, Chicago. And uh, Bobby and I uh, sort of, she, she became a full-time member of the faculty about six years after I did. She was teaching part-time at first because she had two young boys. And she and her husband were practicing law together. So she was filling in uh, with in Adrian Cragen's class on tax. And Bobby and I said, well, you know, let's take the women graduates out to lunch. So Barbara joined us and Bobby and I invited the women students who were graduating. First there were you know, three or four of them and then there were 10 or 15 of them. And by the time it got to be 25 or 30 of them, we stopped doing the lunch and we had a reception. But, but you know, it, was, it was really remarkable because I, I remember Mary Ann Katati, who was one of our really good students, uh, was at a meeting somewhere where people were asking her about the, her days at, at, at birth. I, mean, I think it may have been at one of my retirement parties as dean. And somebody said, well, did you have a women's room at the law school when you were a student there? And she pointed to me and she said, she was our women's room. Mm -hmm. so, but it's just remarkable. I've, I've heard from so many of my women students and women that I've seen and, and, and other connections. And, you know, I, I just love knowing, and, and, and I've been toward men too. I mean, Greg Hobbs, now in the Supreme Court of Colorado, was one of my students, and he wrote a poem dedicated to me, which is in my other published oral history, and, and it was just, uh, it was just lovely. Mm -hmm. This is perhaps related. Can you, when you're looking back on your career, can you share um, a couple things that you? personally find are some of the most rewarding experiences you've had? Oh, well, the teaching is, is you know, I think uh, the, the ability to, to, to get in touch with young people who are going out in the world and do great things and help, <coughs> help facilitate what they're trying to do, excuse me. The, um, the legal papers that I've written uh, have been received uh, very well. The ones that I wrote on no-fault divorce and, and on my Hague lectures on the conflict of laws and other pieces that I've written. Um, but the pro project that I've loved most of all is this project that I'm now completing on the uh, early women law professors. Mm -hmm. That was a real labor of love. I started working on it in 1989 before I became dean and then in 1992 when I became dean I had to lay it aside for the uh, eight years that I served as dean no I'm sorry the six years I served as dean and um, then I took it up again and uh, it's, it's just been incredibly uh, engrossing and, and just so wonderful because when you read that list of the first 14 women to any 
group of people, lawyers. Um, Soya Menchikov is the only one they've heard of, and whoever the other woman is from their school, because that's why I was interviewing them. And today, when you tell younger students about that book that I'm writing, they don't even remember Soya Menchikov. So this is a story that's rapidly being lost, and I decided to retrieve it, and, and I, I think it will be retrieved. Mm -hmm. What about some of the more frustrating experiences? Um, more frustrating experiences, let me think. Well, I, I, I think a lot of the more frustrating experiences were, uh, were with the legislature. Uh, and, and that was when we were getting the no-fault divorce law enacted. And they were, uh, I think, a little bit leery of, of trying to go quite that far. And they rewrote the uh, grounds for divorce, which we had put in. We, we went with a uh, pure no-fault ground, uh, the uh, irretrievable breakdown of the marriage. Uh, and they um, said, no, no, it has to be uh, based on causes uh, that make it intolerable to live together, or something like that. I forget the exact wording. But it was a way of kind of bringing fault in through the back door because you had to give reasons for the breakdown. And so when um, we were interviewed by the uh, press after that law was passed, they said, well, how did you get to the idea of this no-fault divorce? And Bob Levy and I said, what no-fault divorce? <laughs> but it turned out that the, the rest of the country came along, and by the time New York adopted a modern no-fault law, they had had a voluntary separation for two years for a while. It now has swept the country, and every, every state has a no-fault divorce law. Can you tell me a little bit more about um, that experience, the opportunity to work you know, with some of the work you've been doing in your scholarship and put that into practice through this policy work and legislation? Yeah, well, it was um, a, a time when if you wanted to get anything done, in family law, you had to do it through the legislature because the, the judges you know, were so kind of set in their ways about most of these uh, you know, kind of dyads of husband, wife, man, woman, you know, man, the provider, woman, the uh, dependent supporter, and all that. And to break through all that, I, I think, actually, I think it was in part that work on the divorce uh, reform bill that, that led me into sex discrimination because it was so obvious that. Uh, something was going on here that was bigger than family law. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me um, a little bit about the, your transition from professor to dean? Oh, well, the, um, I, I, my, the students wanted me to put my name in, and, and I allowed them to put me forward when Jesse Chofer was uh, also after the job. And it turns out Jesse got the job. and. Uh, Jesse said when asked what his proudest moment was in the selection process, he said, I'm proudest of having beaten out Herma Hilke. <laughs> and uh, so after he uh, served out his eight years, um, then uh, I was put forward again and I became dean after Jesse. And it was um, really a, a very remarkable time because the students had sat in on Sandy Kadish's office and they'd sat in on Jesse's office and they really uh, felt that they were uh, at odds with the administration. And when I came in, you know, they knew what my views were, which is why they wanted to back me. And so they were very supportive um, at first, but then uh, I got to be a little bit intransigent for them too when the, the regents passed the affirmative action resolution banning affirmative action. And they were outside my office saying, well, uh, if they won't repeal this, you should resign. And I said, why? Who do you think is going to get who's going to be even more supportive of this than I am? So I didn't resign, but they marched down to the steps of Sproul Hall and, <clears throat> and denounced me because I was afraid to resign. But it was so cute because as they were marching down to Sproul Hall, one of them came back and whispered in my ear, Professor K, Dean K, she says, I hope you don't take this personally. I thought, oh, of course not. I know you have to protest indeed. And you didn't? No. In fact, she later invited me to speak at a, um, a, 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 I think it was, a, I forget now what the name of the day was, but it was up in Seattle. Uh, and they were honoring you know, groups of people who'd worked to reform the law. And she said, in introducing me, um, you know, how do you 
staff a protest when the woman you're protesting against has spent her whole life working for the causes that you're trying to get through. And I, when I got up, I said, you know, I think it's probably not as good as you might think to have somebody introduce you who knows you quite that well. <laughs> what was it like as the dean working with the rest of the faculty? Well, we didn't have any uh, internal struggles among the faculty while I was dean. Uh, and I, I had spent a lot of time doing um, uh, administrative committee work with the central administration. Uh, and so I, I was very closely in touch with the uh, campus administration and with the uh, deans of, of other schools. And I began building a network that's only intensified since then. <clears throat> and so we had, I think, uh, we, we came away from being an isolationist group on campus that wanted to run its own show and some group that really was willing to work with the campus and, and uh, with the administration. And I think that was a, a very good forward step. How, if at all, do you think being a woman affected those relationships? And it sounds like you kind of made things more cooperative, in a sense, with the larger university. <clears throat> well, that's a comment that's been made about the way women do administration. Um, and I think it's, it, I think it's true. I, I was reminded uh, here at this meeting when uh, I met with the uh, Barbara Studenmund and, and uh, Jane LaBarbera, both of whom were in the AALS administration when I was the uh, president. And they both said the same thing. You were so supportive of the staff. Mm -hmm. And the same thing was true at Berkeley. Uh, we had these, uh, these sort of fiscal crises and we were told we had to lay people off. And I said, no, I'm not laying anybody off. If people leave, I'm just not gonna refill those positions, but I'm not laying anybody off. And to this day, you know, all these many years after I've been dean, uh, the staff is willing to do anything for me that I really need. <laughs> and you know, it's, um, I, th I think you have to understand that the staff really run any major organization. And if you don't give them the credit that they deserve, then you're going to have difficulties. Do you feel like your relationship with the faculty while you were dean was uh, different than it had been when you had been a faculty member, or maybe different? No, it, 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 it's quite different, uh, and, and uh, I, I think one of the things, that several deans have said this, you know, that um, symposium that Toledo runs every year about uh, uh, deaning, and they get young deans to write, some older deans too. Uh, what they all say is that um, you're placed in a different position, um, and it's quite true, and you know, you, you never quite realize, I mean, there are faculty who think that the organization runs to support them, mm -hmm. and then there are faculty who are more cooperative, and you have to sort of learn to work with, uh, with both groups. Mm -hmm. They have to learn to work with you. One hopes. <laughs> Can you tell me a little more about your um, presidency of AALS and what it was like to have that leadership position and work with faculty all across the country? I'm sorry, the president of what? A double ALS. Oh, double ALS. Yes. Well, that was that was really quite rewarding. I think and one of the things that I tried to to do as the president of AALS was to get the the major law schools to participate because in those days, you know, the, the Harvards and Yales of this world uh, couldn't care less about what the AALS did, uh, and they didn't even bother to participate in the recruitment conference because they invited the people they wanted to hire to come directly to the campus. And um, Al Sachs, who was then the dean at Harvard, <coughs> uh, and I were very good friends. So <coughs> Al Sachs was willing to take on a leadership role and participate in, in the governance of the AALS. And his example was really um, uh, quite pivotal in getting other schools. And I was really pleased to, to see on the program this year uh, you know, that, that Robert Post, the dean of Yale, is giving a talk, I guess, today. Robert had been my colleague at Chicago. I mean, at, at, yeah, at Chicago. And uh, <coughs> at Berkeley, why am I saying Chicago? I think, I think all the way through this interview, I've been talking about saying Chicago when I mean Berkeley. So I don't know how we're going to go through and correct that, but I guess You've we... You've been saying Berkeley. I, I, yeah, but I mean, it, before, you know, I don't know whether you can go back and redo that or not. But yes, we, we, we had been colleagues at Berkeley, and, and it was just wonderful to see that going on. Yeah. Yeah.
Do you feel like um, in that in any of those leadership positions, are there things you remember about getting pushback um, or comments that were made about you being a woman or that you felt were based on the fact that you're a woman? There was nothing overt, um, but I think that uh, there was a fair amount of unconscious you know, acting out. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any examples of things that happened? Nothing comes to mind at the moment. So looking back, would you change any of the choices that you made or follow different paths if you had to do everything over again? Not at all. How would you say the environment has changed, if at all, for women lawyers and women faculty over your career? Well, I think it's, uh, it's better in some areas than it is in, in other areas. Uh, and uh, I think that one of the important things that the um, section on women in legal education is doing is that it's reaching out to women who are in areas that are not quite as um, uh, up to snuff as they should be uh, on this question. And I think that's very helpful because once you have the sense that you have an organization behind you, uh, I think that's uh, really very encouraging. Mm -hmm. Are there particular milestones that you feel have been encouraging and have improved things for women? Oh, well, I think the, uh, <clears throat> the numbers of women entering legal education is remarkable. Uh, when I left the, when I, when I joined the, uh, uh, when I became dean at, at, uh, at Berkeley, there were, um, the second year I was dean, we had 50% women in the first year class. Mm -hmm. And by the time I stepped down as dean uh, in 2000, we had 60% women in the student body. And that has not been that high since, uh, but that was, I think, quite remarkable. And there was no other law school anywhere close to our standing that had that kind of ratio. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that we were, we went out of our way to be welcoming to women. I mean, there, there was all that history of Nancy Davis and Wendy Williams and Mary Dunlap writing these little booklets, sending them around to all the uh, college counselors in the country called Wanted by the Law Women. And for a while, Berkeley had the reputation of being uh, the most welcoming place for women law professors in the country. And then we had two unfortunate tenure denials, that both of which ultimately got reversed, but it kind of created the image you know, that, uh, that we were not uh, as welcoming as other schools. And some of our competition used to <laughs> regularly say to young women, well, if you want to have a tenure struggle, accept Berkeley's offer. <laughs> but I think we've overcome that now, and, and, and we have a, a really thriving group of younger scholars, all of whom we are in danger of losing because uh, other schools are trying to set their sights on these wonderful newcomers, most of whom were recruited by Chris Edley, uh, who was a really dynamic dean. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about you know, the, those years of having a really welcoming environment for women, are there particular strategies that you or others employed to create that environment? Well, we, create, we created the, um, uh, the sort of network uh, of women law prof well, women professors across the campus, uh, bringing their graduate students uh, into um, sort of meetings with each other. And uh, that was something that really uh, was quite remarkable across the campus. And that also created an institutional support for these women. What impact do you think your scholarship has had on issues affecting women in the law or feminist theory? Well, people have been nice enough to say that, that, that our sex discrimination book has been quite influential. Mm -hmm. uh, the first edition was edited by Ruth Bader Ginsburg and uh, Kenneth Davidson and myself, and I wrote about that uh, in that uh, symposium called mm -hmm. Creating a Space in the Law School Curriculum. Um, and it's now gone into its seventh edition, uh, and uh, it's just remarkable how receptive people have been to it. And what about your work in No Fault Divorce? So in issues affecting women 
practically speaking, women everywhere. No, I think that's right, and and I think that the uh, the, the ALI picked up the financial aspects of that and, and, and tried to they, they left the full divorce ground intact, but they tried to do more with the uh, property division and child support and spousal support. Not all of those reforms have been as widely accepted yet, but I think ultimately they will be. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit, sort of generally over your career, about balancing your professional and your private life? Uh, could you rephrase that question? Yeah. Um, what are some of the challenges if any, that you faced in balancing your personal life and your professional career? Well, I, I never had any um, babies of my own. Uh, when I married uh, uh, Dr. Brodsky, I uh, inherited three wonderful boys. I adopted the younger one, uh, Tom, and the, the other two uh, have been very supportive of me. And then as the uh, wonderful four grandchildren came along, uh, we felt that we were building a family in, in, uh, reaching out and enjoying them with their parents. And so that's been uh, uh, really quite fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And they were always very good because in the years when the um, ALI always had the summer meetings on, it sort of turned out to be on Mother's Day weekend, and I would traipse off to DC for this meeting and I would say to Tom and, and the other kids living at home, well, you know, we'll just have to postpone the Mother's Day celebration for a week. Okay. <laughs> so they were very flexible about that. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that there have been changes for younger women coming into legal education over the years? So with this issue specifically in terms of balancing career and... Oh, I think so. I mean, I, I think a lot of places now have, have support for um, child care and, and for uh, family uh, uh, opportunity to, to have uh, caretakers provided moments of stress and things like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think the working world is different for women attorneys now than it was in your earlier years in the profession? Yes, I think it is. I think it is improving. Uh, there's still a, a glass ceiling uh, and I think that we need to do more work on getting women in the man managerial positions in law schools. Uh, I mean, in the law firms, uh, but I think that, uh, that that is coming along slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. So what, what can we do? What are some ways that we can try to improve that situation? So it's, I think it's around 20% um, of partners are women in, in large law firms. So how do we in, improve or increase that number? Um, well... <laughs> I think it's just going to take um, a lot of effort to try and get women in managerial positions. I think there are even fewer women managing partners. Uh, and so I think that, that we have to work hard to get women in, in positions where they can be more influential in the sort of uh, getting law firm personnel to understand what's, uh, what's necessary here. I was wondering if you could reflect on some of the very many awards and honors that you've received, um, including yesterday's, if you'd like. Um, but you know, there there are so many. So if if a few sort of stand out to you, if you could reflect on um, what they've meant to you. Well, the Margaret Brent Award was, of course, one of the earliest ones that I got, and, and that was um, uh, really uh, quite uh, remarkable. And I think I was chosen in the second year that that, that those awards were given. Um, and um, Can more. You explain what was remarkable about it for you and well, it, why it was significant. Well, it was um, an award that recognized the uh, uh, contributions of women, uh, and, and they tried to identify the women who had been most influential in bringing other women into the profession. So I, I felt that that was a, a, real, a real honor to have that recognition. And then uh, uh, as I'm getting further along in my teaching career and closer to the uh, uh, age when most people normally would retire. I've gotten <clears throat> a Lifetime Achievement Award from um, the, uh, the, the, the Berkeley uh, Alumni Association. That was the first one they gave. And then yesterday, that wonderful Lifetime Achievement Award given in the name of my good friend, Ruth Ginsburg. And, you know, I think that if enough people tell me that this is a Lifetime Achievement Award, they're saying, or um, it may be time for you to move on. I don't think anyone's saying that. 
<laughs> I haven't heard that for sure. <laughs> and so, um, how, you know, when, when you got the news that you received this, these awards, um, aside from, you know, thinking, is this a hint about doing something different, um, how else did you respond? Oh, well, I was totally uh, overwhelmed and delighted to get the uh, award here yesterday, uh, in part because of what Ruth has meant to me over the years. And so um, uh, I had decided when they invited me to come to be uh, the first speaker on the Conflict of Laws panel yesterday morning at 8.30, I had told Simon that I couldn't make the trip. And so when I got this award, I thought, well, now I have to make the trip. Mm -hmm. So I called Simeon back and said, well, I'll be there. So yeah. yesterday was a busy day for me. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about your relationship with Justice Ginsburg over the years? Well, she and I uh, first started working together on the book, of course. And at that point, she was uh, a law professor, uh, as so was I. And then when she got appointed to the bench, uh, we saw each other less frequently, but we still managed to keep in touch. And she and, and Marty and uh, Carol and I actually uh, met each other in, uh, in, in Europe. And uh, of course, Ruth was being chauffeured around by the people from the Supreme Court in those big limousines. And so it was just quite a, a whiz to go out to, um, uh, to dinner with them in places like New York and London and so on. It was lovely. Yeah. If you were giving advice to a young woman just entering or getting out of law school now, what would you tell her? Don't let anything stand in your way. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like you've lived by that? Uh, as closely as I could. Has your understanding of gender and integration challenges changed over time? Oh yes. I think that it's um, uh, a much more pervasive problem than any of us realized. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, with the uh, now emphasis on sexual harassment and the uh, many forms, uh, both overt and covert, that that takes. I think we're just getting to the tip of that iceberg. And in dealing with some of these experiences yourself, did you have any experiences of disillusionment or hopelessness or, you know, sort of feeling overwhelmed at, at the challenges ahead? Oh, well, I, th I think everybody feels overwhelmed at one point or another. Uh, the question is how quickly can you put it behind you and, and, and go on? And um, I've been pretty good at doing that. Are there particular um, methods that you have or strategies you've employed to do that? Well, what helps you sort of get beyond, right, and look um, forward? Well, I, I, I think I sort of uh, stopped doing what I was doing for an afternoon mm -hmm. and went flying or went to um, see a show or read a book. Uh, and kind of got the immediate pressing problems out of my mind. Uh, and then the next morning I was ready to go again. Is there anything that you thought I would ask about and didn't? Or anything you wish I had asked you about that you want to share here? Mira, you cover all the bases. <laughs> um, okay, then. Is there anything you're glad I didn't ask? No comment. No comment. Okay. I think we'll end on that note. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you.